My name is Christopher Palin. I'm a cardiac anaesthetist from the John Radcliffe Office, uh, Hospital. Um, I'm going to declare an interest, and that interest is in off-pump surgery. Um, uh, I'm, I'm certainly a fan. Um, and I'm going to present my view and uh, as a cardiac anaesthetist of why practice has become um, quite so polarised. I think, uh, may I say, I think it's changing over the last few years um, and perhaps not quite as polarised as it used to be a, a few years ago when I started. I think there is, I've, I've grouped three, three separate um, important groups here that uh, contribute to the story of, of off-pump, uh, particularly in this country. Um, and the first one, though, that we'll talk about is clinical indication, who needs it. The other one is, is patient safety, which is a, obviously a, um, a hot topic at the moment. Um, and the other one is experience and training, who trains who and when. Let me say, I think my interpretation of the data is that the benefits of off-pump surgery are becoming clearer. Um, I think there is a high-risk population. I think that high-risk population is probably growing. Um, and I think we could um, define the kind of patient which we would recommend having off-pump surgery. Um, I think that uh, it is, clinical care is obviously important in terms of planning. Um, patient safety, there is clear internal and external scrutiny of individual results um, and there's you know, widespread concern amongst teams and surgeons about figures um, and how they're interpreted. Uh, team working is, is um, particularly important to off-pump surgery and um, there is important that we focus on conversion between on and off-pump surgery. Emergency conversion to off-pump surgery, to on-pump surgery clearly um, will, um, has a deleterious effect on the patient and good team working in and around that area can reduce that rate. And I think it's important when we talk about experience in a minute and training that people seek to minimize their emergency conversion rate. Talking about training of juniors and in certainly the experience and training for consultants I think we can no longer regard the consultantship as the be and end all of training. It's the start of a journey, uh, a career, where new skills need to be picked up. Um, I don't think that people coming off the um, training programs in this country now are, are the full, the real deal, the full shilling. They need to, uh, need to consider where they're going to be in five or ten years' time. And this, I think, is the most important reason why <coughs> practice is so polarised. I was going to talk, call this the off-pump mountain, but I think it's probably nicer to call it the off-pump tree, i.e. that the, the rich pickings of off-pump surgery at the top, most people start down at the bottom. There is a, a raft of patients at the bottom, the majority of patients <coughs> are patients are not going to benefit particularly from <coughs> off-pump surgery, yet we know that you need to gain experience at the lower level in order to um, reap the benefits of the patients at the top. Now this is difficult for teams who start at the bottom. The surgeons who start at the bottom with little experience of off-pump surgery, how do they get to the top there? Um, without initial training in off-pump surgery, they uh, face an uphill struggle in order to get to the top. And most Surgeons in this country that I've met are essentially self-taught in this regard, that they've taken on lower risk cases, built up a confidence within their team and themselves, and then they can, in those high volume centres, they can uh, reap the benefits, as I say, at the top. But I think it's important, in terms of polarisation, as we move forward, that we can find a way that teams and surgeons who start at the bottom here can find their way to the top, to the benefit of those patients. Um, who existed there. Thank you. Th thanks, Chris. I think what we would probably <coughs> can discuss this for five minutes or so, and then to try and get back on time, we'll ask David Gleaner to give a talk. But just to get a feel for this in the audience just now, how many of us, I presume everyone in this room is here because they do coronary artery bypass grafting at least some of the time. So... In this room, how many of us, if you wouldn't mind just sh by a show of hands, how many do off-pump surgery at all? 
So maybe one third. And of those people who do off-pump surgery, who uses it in at least 50% of their cases? So more, more, more or less the same. And I think that really tells you that... So the majority of this room, assuming that we're, we're all doing coronary bypass grafting, only a relatively small proportion of us actually do off-pump surgery. For, would anyone who doesn't routinely or do any off-pump surgery, is there anyone who feel, can explain why they don't do it? Or they, hand over here, please. Can we have a microphone, please? Thank you. Neil Roberts from the Arts. So I, you know, I think the, the data is conflicting. We, we all agree. But I think one of the problems is that on pump surgery, there are very different ways of doing it. And um, a lot of people still do on pump surgery the way it was done 15 years ago, cooling to 28 with just a single shot of anti-grade cardioplegia and then do the bottom ends as quickly as you can and then walk out of the room and let someone inexperienced put the top ends on with multiple applications of a side-biting clamp. And that mode of, of on-pump surgery um, is probably old-fashioned and probably can't um, be uh, judged against the more modern ways of doing on-pump surgery because we know aortic manipulation is is detrimental, so staying warm, using retrograde cardioplegia, doing all the anastomoses with the single application of a, uh, of a single cross clamp. That kind of um, on-pump surgery, um, we're, 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 we've just looked at our single clamp data and looking at the troponin release, the, even with a cross clamp time of 70 minutes to do three grafts, doing the top ends with the cross clamp on, the troponin release is, you know, significantly lower than than anti-grade cold okay but so, so 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 i think there's you know you're not answering the question i asked well, i asked for someone who doesn't do off pump surgery to try and stand up and tell me why they don't what i'm saying is the 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 data just doesn't stack up right so you don't believe the data any other views because it doesn't it, Specifically, because it doesn't relate to modern on, modern on pump surgery. I okay. think that's that's the most important. Right. So you're not persuaded by the data that off pump surgery may be an advantage at all, at all. Even in the higher risk. Even patients. in the high risk patients. No, because okay. I'm not cooling and single. <coughs> okay, so you've got an 84 year old, tight calcified left main stem stenosis, a lot of vascular disease. Cardiologist says to you, we can't do this patient. It's technically not possible to do PCI. Do you, what do you, th do you think that doing them on pump, clamping the aorta, is as good as doing two mammaries off pump? In, in, that, in, that, in that patient, there's maybe an argument. I, I still think one mammary, one bone, with a single application of the clamp, okay. you won't show a difference in on versus modern off pump. Okay. Any other views on this? Because we're looking to try and understand the polarisation of views. Or have we done it to death now? Vipin, good. Sometimes this particular patient that you just described could be turned down for surgery, you know, on some other grounds. And that often happens in the real world. And then yeah. the surgeon will be prepared to do it off pump in one or two ways. Mm -hmm. So are there many in the room then convinced, persuaded, or sorry, I should say, are most of us in this room who don't do off pump surgery is the fundamental reason because you don't think there's convincing evidence Gianni. Can I make another suggestion? Why is not everybody doing mitral repair? And mitral repair is done by a minority of surgeons. Yeah, but mitral... Is mind, or is yeah. Mitral <coughs> repair is very difficult off pump. <coughs> <laughs> ben. I, I'm not sure how useful the polarisation of this debate is. And I think that if you want to be an effective cardiac surgeon who can give the best for the patient who's in front of you, you have to have some flexibility about what you do. I agree with the point that actually if you are doing routine coronary artery surgery, not having uh, an off-pump ability actually is denying potential benefits to patients that you see in front of you. So I think... Every and, and, and there's debate about what the appropriate case is. But I think this uh, 
debate about are you an on-pump guy or are you an off-pump guy is probably missing the point. There is a spectrum of techniques here which will benefit different patients. There will be some interpretation about how that plays in, and that's where we should be able to get to. Okay, good. Some hands coming up now, but let me just make a general point very quickly on this. But the danger with this argument is, so if someone says to me, uh, I say, do you do off-pump surgery? And they say, oh, I reserve that for my high-risk cases. I think, well, you're a fool. <laughs> because the last time you want to be doing an occasional it's technique is in a difficult case. The reason you've got to be able to do it, or the reason you're confident to do it in a difficult case is because you do it routinely. So, and I can tell you this, and Jenny hinted at it when he said, you know, off-pump surgery is a package. You've got to look at the surgeon and the operation. They go together. You can't separate these out, and Jan is absolutely correct. But I wouldn't think this is very important. If you're going to do off-pump surgery, it is a bit more technically demanding. But once you get your comfort zone, then you do it comfortably. But it's not an occasional operation. Can I just pass one little comment? I mean, I, I've not said very much yet. Bro knows that we do a lot of off-pump work. Um, the problem with the occasional off-pump procedure is that you end up with results like we've had presented today. Um, um, you can't have the occasional, I'm going to try and do something about it today because I think it's a good idea. Unless you've practiced at it and you do start with the lower risk patients and then go ahead. We changed to off-pump not because we had problems with, with our, our on-pump results, we were doing what I would suggest was also modern uh, back in uh, modern on pump surgery back in, in, in the late 90s, retrograde, single clamp, etc., etc. But it still wasn't right. It still was something that we could do better, particularly with the neurological incidence of problems. Okay, okay we have th th there are two men, two people had their hands up, and then we'll come to you, Ben. So, two hands over, please. Uh, Jens Norex from Manchester. From a Chinese perspective, and just uh, re looking at the data and uh, published papers, uh, just when reading up things, you can see that for mitral valve repairs, like in the American registries, things have changed with a tremendous kind of dramatic, like 200% increase in the amount of mitral repair they've been seeing. So I think it's a multi-level issue, and we're looking at a pyramid structure, and we're the addressing at the moment established surgical practices. So people who have been doing on-pump for 10, 20 years will not actually change. And absolutely right, we've all seen a difficult case in theater when everybody kind of thinks that that should have been done off-pump now turns into a disaster many times. Um, so we should be looking at the level probably beneath that pyramid at the training and what the modern surgeon needs nowadays through the training pr pro process. So people can't be expected at certain age at stage of their career which is established to start doing like perfect mitral repairs or perfect off-pump cases if they haven't gone through the modern kind of training like the States, Germany, from all these kind of registry data. So I think we're addressing, we've identified the problem, but we're not actually, Interesting. Uh, you know, nipping it in the bud. So. I just say we agree that, you know, training is the deficit here. The exposure yeah. is the deficit. Deficit, yeah. Okay, so there was one other hand here, then Ben, then Vipin, and then we'll, I think we need to move on. Please. Uh, David McCormick from London. Two relatively small points. First of all, organisationally, uh, just to highlight, uh, you said that if people would do off-pump when required and it was a high-risk cases, do we not, is the obligation not to provide service to the patient and therefore make sure the NHS on a microcosm, the unit, can provide off-pump surgery if required? And on a second point with regard to training, the off-pump enthusiasts, I really do not think anyone will win the fight to convert the on-pump surgeons to convert their practice. I think the only way it will become more prevalent in the future is if the trainees are trained and confident with it and take it with them into their uh, careers. I don't so, think anyone's going to get... So we come back to training again. So it was Ben, then Vipin, then I guess, and then after this we need to move on. Okay, Ben? I just wanted to challenge you two wise men at the front for your response to my comments. That was a, a very polarised position you took, which I don't think was really in any way evidence-based and had a certain hint of arrogance sort of running through it. The idea that uh, somebody like myself, who has in his life done a significant amount of off-pump surgery, has got himself trained up but now elects to do that on specified patients because where I see the benefit. The suggestion that I cannot do that as safely as somebody who's doing bigger volumes I don't think is necessarily backed up by the evidence. And I think one of the reasons why this becomes such a polarised debate 
is because some of the enthusiasts for the process overstate the case, which actually creates some of this sort of conflict in the system. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to go back then to Jani's slide. This is me showing a bit of arrogance, but I think it's actually common sense. I can tell you this, whether you're playing tennis, a concert pianist, or an off-pump sergeant, the more you do of it, the luckier you get. And I do not believe off-pump surgery is an occasional... I don't know what you do, and I wasn't making any aspirations about you personally, Ben, but what I am saying <laughs> is that off-pump surgery is not an occasional technique. It's definitely not. And I would say that anyone who's not, now this is a ballpark figure, but I would have thought that if you're not doing at least 30% of your cases off pump, you're not in your comfort zone with that technique. Brian? I, I would agree entirely with that. I mean, if, to me, if it's good for the bad, it has to be good for the good, good as well. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so two final comments. <coughs> Vipin and then our guest from India, and then... Uh, I, I do believe the evidence, but the reason I don't do mitral repair is because I'm not very good at it. I don't have too much experience in it, therefore I don't do it. It's back to training and exposure. Yeah. Vipin, you need to get some arrogance. <laughs> no, so I can pass it on to my other colleagues who can do it better. So. Okay, great. And our guest from India again, sir? I could not again. Just one point. I think, you know, we've been a little bit sort of uh, cluttered in our thinking about surgical training. In our perspective, where we have a lot of pressure and demand on coronary surgery programs, we use the simulation and the wet lab models a lot more for training young yeah. people yeah. to taking the inhibition away. Because still, I think in this day and age, to expose to a chap to do their first initial uh, off-pump work on a, on a live, a live patient setting is still a little bit of primitive thinking. Yeah. So perhaps we should be uh, adopting simulation models and the wet lab schemes a lot more. We've done it and we found it rewarding. Yeah. If I could just add, I had the privilege of being in a meeting in Houston about two months ago. And this was at um, the Methodist Hospital in Houston, and I have to say their training facilities were far superior to what, you know, for, I mean, for training on actually um, plastic models or, or animal hearts were far superior to what I have in the NHS for real patients. But they had two great models, absolutely great models. One was just a little plastic model that moved around, and this is how they trained them to do coronary anastomosis. And then they moved on to where they had pig hearts, and they put a balloon into the pig heart. They filled it with, they connected it up to a, a water pressure system, and then it, the heart was moving all the time. So it was an animal heart, but it was, it was just absolutely superb model. And that's, when you see this kind of thing, you immediately, it just transforms your thinking in how you should train people. So I think your points are very, very well made. Can I just bring Andrew Muir in to, for a comment? Andrew um, has uh, is, is done an off-pump fellowship with us now for the last uh, year or so. Uh, you have some comment, Andrew, from a training perspective? I'm working under a pool now for 15 months, and before I'd gone, I'd done a single case off pump, which was, I think, the traditional trainee's job of a single Lima to LED to the front of the heart. And on day one, I did my first case with grafting at the back of the heart. <clears throat> I went as a year six, and I've done about 90% of the coronaries I've done since I've been there have been off pump. And I found it comfortable almost from the word go. The setup was very straightforward. The coronary anastomosis itself doesn't move if it's set up appropriately. And I found it no more difficult uh, than the previous couple of hundred cases I'd done. <coughs> it was because I was sort of led in gently, I think. I was given reasonable cases to begin with. I just wanted to bring Andrew in there ones. simply because if the, if the trainee yeah. is exposed to the technique and the, and the quantity, then the comfort zone comes Absolutely. very, very quickly. Yeah. And then when you go into your own clinical practice, you can then do what Ben is saying, perhaps be a bit more specific or be complete if you want to. The final point I want to make, there should never be emergency conversion to pump. I think you were mentioning emergency conversion. The conversion to pump should always be a planned, slow process. Yeah. Should, you shouldn't be crashing onto bypass because you can pick up when things are not quite right.